Um, I would like to begin today uh, by acknowledging that no matter where the speakers or where you are right now, you are on Native and Indigenous land. I am here on the Nis on Nisanan Miwok land in Sacramento, California. Um, and I also wanna take a minute to acknowledge that while land acknowledgements are very important, um, we should all be considering how to give native land back if possible. We would also like to voice our support for the ongoing um, systematic, I'm um, sorry, the ongoing uh, black liberation struggle and the dismantling of systematic racism and police account and pro having more accountability for police. Uh, systematic racism and colonialism impacts almost every aspect of people's lives today, including environmental, water, health, and food policies. Um, I'd also like to take a minute to introduce you to the topic of indigenous environmental justice. Environmental justice is basically the um, idea that black indigenous and people of color have a right to a healthy environment and healthy um, landscape. So indigenous environmental justice recognizes the um, very real implications of environmental degradation, destruction, and ecologi ecological fascism, fascism that continues in, on indigenous lands today. Um, and there are many people throughout the world, indigenous communities, nations, um, that are fighting for the health and protection of their homelands. And a lot of that happens here in California. So we will have some great speakers um, who will be introducing the concept of it, environmental in justice in indigenous communities um, around the world and in California. So I'd like to introduce today our speakers, uh, Tia Oros Peters Zuni is the executive director of the Seventh Generation Fund for Indigenous People and Morningstar Galley from the Pitt Ritter Rivers Tribe is a tribal organizer from Save California Salmon. Um, I will also be presenting a topic on indigenous art and activism in environmental justice movements. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass over the presentation to Tia. Kashi, and thank you for inviting me to this conversation. First, I wanna recognize the spirits that are here with us, ancient and everlasting and to acknowledge them and thank those ancestors for being with us here today. They're always with us. Even in moments like these on cyber platforms like Zoom, Facebook Live, their ever presence shapes and informs us on an ongoing basis in our thinking, in our doing, and in all of our ways of being as water protectors, as land defenders, and now with the movements that are happening all over the ground. And in the days and the times to come before us, I acknowledge and I thank the Weop Nation whose ancestors' imprints, their echoes are present here in the air, the water, the landscape, and from whose territory I share these words with you today. As mentioned in my biography, I serve as the CEO of the Seventh Generation Fund for Indigenous Peoples. And we're a transnational organization. Our vision and our work serves Indigenous peoples all over the world. Our purpose is re-indigenization, which is the active and dynamic process of recovery traditional relationships to land, community, culture, and spirit for self-determination, for collective liberation, and to restore balance. As a native identity-based organization that came out of the grassroots and remains focused there, our work centers indigenous peoples, our decolonization and liberation, and it spans an array of issues and sectors and arenas and geographies. It's not confined to colonial borders or to colonial thinking. It's indigenous ways of being, indigenous thinking, indigenous liberation. Core to what we do throughout the indigenous world is expressing, manifesting the belief in the inherent strength and capacity of indigenous peoples. We organize around our assets, not our weaknesses, and that we understand our own issues. We know that we have challenges and we know that we understand them ourselves and that we will find, create and develop culturally and ecologically harmonious solutions to respond to our issues or to remedy them, to heal from them. Our organization works to mobilize informational, training and technical assistance, 
financial resources to equip and empower grassroots peoples all over the world. Because we are the first responders to create our own distinct knowledge systems, our locations, our cultures, and contexts as we move forward. We were founded in 1977, and this is our 43rd year. I'm gonna stop here to share a clip from a video that we did called Water is Life, Indigenous Perspectives on Water. But we did this in um, October, 2012. It features frontline community leaders who are engaged in frontline grassroots actions for water. Water carries memories like computer. Cells, which is why when the rains come, say thank you for visiting. Thank you for remembering, meaning water is memory. So you yourself contains not only your memories, but memories of your ancestors going way, way, way back. It'll never be destroyed. And we will always be with the ancestors. Traditional people who try to prevent this. It's a terrible waste of water. And to them, by allowing that to happen, we are telling our ancestors we don't need them anymore. So they don't come anymore, rarely because we're wasting water. We're breaking a basic law to not waste water. Because actually they're destroying life. They're destroying the mother, mother of all life. And, you know, which includes water as well because that's part of the destruction too because they're pumping all that water out. And once you destroy the land and the water, you're destroying life, including your own life the life of your future, the life of your future, the future of your own children, your grandchildren, and so forth down the line, you know? You can't do that. The common theme that seems to resonate in the village is that Awetlankusa, in other words, the earth is drying up. Awetelin Tsitta Kusa, Mother Earth is drying up. Not just to us who is here, but Everybody around the world, you know, we need water. We need water. Water is what keeps keeps us going because um, our, our bodies are made up of water. And so that's why um, water is not only important, but um, should be most likely the most sacred element um, in the world right now. You know, Because without water, we can't exist as a people. We can't survive um, to quench that thirst that we have. I think we're having some technical difficulties. So I think what I would recommend is that we just close out on those images, if the technical person could do that. And we'll just, we'll just kind of go from here. It's the new world, right? We've been talking about water warriors and our lands and cultures and people, sometimes technical things don't always work. Well, it's from that context and I, I know you got a chance to hear it. Um, and, and maybe we'll be able to put in the, in the uh, chat, the clip, it's a longer video, a few minutes longer. And um, it's shown in that clip 
um, when we get a chance to see it, that um, it's from that, that context that I share with these words with you today for today's session. Because for indigenous peoples, the attack on our life and on our ways, the aquicide, the violence and the taking of our waters has taken its form early. This is nothing new. It took its form immediately at colonial invasion. It came with the savagery that assaulted our shores, trespassed our homelands, transgressed our cultures, and violated our peoples from the very first steps onto our territories. And it continues to do so. This is especially apparent and important to recognize and understand that when we come together to talk about uh, critical issues um, that pertain to indigenous peoples, frontline actions, particularly these that protect water and defend land, we need to put it into the context of history and the ongoing colonization of our lands and peoples, of our waters and of our territories. There is an ongoing and mindful commitment of our peoples though, to organize responses to the targeting and devouring of our communities and of our lands, the territories that have been ravaged and torn apart. Indigenous peoples have been engaged in this work for 528 years and we're still counting. What our peoples are up against is the unrelenting violence of a colonial society that can never satisfy its hunger to devour more or for its thirst to drink every last drop of water on this our common mother earth. And it's colonial constructed mindset. It's a social mindset that's been colonial, colonially constructed. It came here, it was not from here. It's from the mainstream thinking that's grounded in individualism, capitalism. It's anti-indigeneity that says everything is for sale. Nothing is valuable unless it can be bought or sold, stolen or taken, exploited or violated. And water, they say, is not the source of all life. It's just here for human use and to perpetuate inequity and greed. It's here to be devoured. But what we say is that we have a right and a responsibility to protect water. Some of us call it kiawe, pa'a, mni, nipi, water, life giver. For indigenous peoples, the significance of water is expressed in a rainbow of songs, of stories and ceremonies, holding a potent place in our cultures, thinking us together in a continuous life affirming cycle. And yet increasingly we see that our territories are either parched or flooded, they're being destroyed by the unquenchable greed of industrialization, a feature of ongoing settler colonialism. Don't believe we are post-colonial. Don't believe what you're told. Unlearn the messages of mainstream society and of the social media world that tell you we're post-colonial. We are not post-colonial if our lands can still be invaded and if the waters can still be killed with impunity. And not so long a time, the earth was moist, it was fertile, life was abundant, it flourished, cultures grew, evolved, peoples prospered, species replicated, mass animal migrations, travel to water sources and food sources, hemispheric journeys of butterflies and hummingbirds flew along currents of moist air. Turtles and whales traveled unhindered along jet streams that spiraled around the globe. Our peoples prayed, and they still do. And we still sing, and we still dance, and we still make offerings for peace and for rain. Water has always been respected for having its own destiny. It belongs to itself, and it's flowed on its own cutting pathways into canyons, creating fertile meadows, filling oceans. But now, this part of the colonial, the colonial journey, we're still confronted we're confronted with that exploitation, with aquicide, the killing of the waters, killing of the waters by dams and diversions, privatization, extractive industrial and mega agricultural development that tears into our homelands and siphons like a vampire our water. It hydrofracking, toxics and pollution, the weaponizing of water against our people like they did at Standing Rock and so many other places. And the other actions, the external actions that assault us and that inhibit and preclude water's ability to nurture, sustain, and generate life. Now, those springs that our ancestors emerged from, from within the womb of Mother Earth, the watersheds that feed our lakes and our cornfields, the water that sustain our bodies, the rivers that carry our prayers, 
They're contaminated. They're stolen. They're vampire siphoned. Human rights violations, including the ongoing invasions onto indigenous territories, whether it be here in this local area of Northern California, whether it be in the desert regions, whether it be in North Dakota, the unhindered exploitation and wrongful taking of water are actions that threaten the very existence of indigenous peoples, our distinct cultures, and our right of religious freedom, and the responsibilities we have of relating to sacred places in medicine making, in memory, and in futurity. These actions threaten our spiritual survival. They threaten the survivability of the planet, and they violate the rights of human, the rights of Mother Earth. So I think about the ancestors, yours and mine, in the early days before invasion and colonization, before individualism got under and into all of our skins and its attendant, like that insatiable greed. I think about how the ancestors became and how they established life and order and continuity and how they stayed in right relation with everything in creation. I think of how they dreamed things into being and through their blood memories and now our own blood as a form of water, we manifest those dreams into indigenous realities. They did this through their distinct worldviews that they traveled, that they passed on to us, bonded to water systems, to their homelands and to the original instructions that they were given. Linked to a continuum of believing and being and of balance, sustainability and forever lasting life, water was at the center. Water is at the center of all things. Because in each word we say, every breath that we take, every tear we shed, we're conceived within, born from, live, breathe, and transcend through water. We are all water beings. Eloqua, thank you. Thank you, Tia. Um, I think you folks could probably tell I was a little nervous when I started, but you so succinctly put all of the things that we're going to be talking about throughout the rest of the series together. And I, I really appreciate that. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I will be presenting next um, on arts, Native American, I'm sorry, nerves are still getting to me, um, on Klamath River activism and art in um, Northern California. So I'm going to share my desktop. Oops. Okay. As Tia said, this is a new world <laughs> that we're all getting used to with the um, Zoom capability. So we appreciate your patience with us as we were working through those things. Um, so my talk is on env environmental injustice, art and activism on the Klamath River Basin. It is um, my dissertation topic. And I really became interested in the topic because I am from Hoopa Valley. Um, we reside along the Trinity River. And we were heavily impacted by the 2002 uh, fish kill. And folks from in within Humboldt County will know and remember that event where upwards of 80,000 uh, mature Chinook salmon uh, died along the riverbanks. And it was a moment that really impacted me. I was a teenager at the time. And it's something that I've thought about for a very long time. Um, and one of the tenets I think of environmental justice tends to focus a lot on policy development and enacting those things through government processes. But um, I was interested in really kind of reflecting on the grassroots advocacy that makes these things possible, like the indigenous people who every day fight for their homelands and um, work towards creating a new world. There you go. Uh, so the Klamath River as home, uh, tribes, Hoopa, Yurok, Shasta, Kruk, Salmon of the Klamath River and its tributaries, uh, Trinity, Trinity, salmon, et cetera. There's a lot of tributaries. I just put the et cetera. Uh, we depend on the basin for cultural and physical revitalization. Our ceremonies take place along the sites, along sites on the river. Um, and fishing is a community event. 
families fish with each other. Families have fishing spots. There's coho salmon, steelhead, coastal cutthroat, uh, green and white sturgeon, and Pacific lamprey. In the Hupa language, I am a terrible linguist, so I'm not going <laughs> to attempt to say uh, the Hupa word for the Trinity River, but it roughly translates to a power one should pray to. So it's a very significant force within the Hupa Valley. And um, I grew up going to the rivers with the river with my grandfather and my family up there and swimming and, and enjoying everything that um, the river had to offer us, ha has to offer us. And it really is uh, the lifeblood of the valley and the of folks up in that area. And I'm gonna show a map of where that's at for people who are not familiar. So this is just a general picture. Um, if I was giving a longer presentation, I'd start breaking down Edward Curtis and his photographs of people and, and placing us within the past. That photograph was taken in 1910. Um, and sort of the implications that go along with uh, that, like not naming native people who were photographed and not recognizing them as people. Um, but I, I, I won't do that. If you have questions about it, you are more than welcome to, uh, reach out to me. So this is uh, the Klamath River tributary. Um, so you can see it is a very large tributary system and it's choked by multiple dams along its system uh, that creates dangerous environments for the Klamath and um, is right for ecological disaster. And folks who have been taking the certificate program, if you had watched the Klamath River updates, you probably have a little bit more of the history and background on that. Um, mine is just a general overview. And if you don't, I suggest going and watching that because it's a great panel. So plant, uh, problems on the Klamath River, a mass diversion of Klamath water to organ farmers and ranchers via four dams. Uh, there's actually more, but these are the dams that are in focus. JC Boyle, Boyle Corpco 1 and 2 and Iron Gate create dangerous conditions on the Klamath River and its trinities, in its tributaries. In 2002, the diversion created toxic overheated water that contributed to a fish kill and upwards of 77,000, 80,000 mature Chinook and coho salmon died on the banks. And this was uh, really the catalyst for a major uh, dam removal effort that was led by many folks, including the Climate Justice Coalition to remove the dams. And it really started as a grassroots um, organization of people coming together along the riverbanks and deciding to do something about it. Um, and that meant traveling to the different owners of the dams and protesting at one point going to Scottish Scotland when it was owned by Scottish power, when the dams were commissioned by Scottish power and then um, then taken over by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway and protesting in Nebraska and Portland. So there's a, a grand tradition of that within the Klamath River area. So this is just what the what the dams look like on the Klamath. Um, and if you watch the Klamath River portion again prior to this one, you'll you will have gotten the updates on what's happening. So I won't go into that here. But if you're interested, please go and watch that um, panel. But you get kind of a sense of where these dams are and uh, what they look like and where the choke points are for the um, river and the tributaries. So what I really wanna talk about today is visual sovereignty. Um, visual sovereignty is a term that is basically focused on the way that indigenous and uh, native people um, enact their sovereignty through different forms of art that can be painting. So on the left is uh, Lynn Risling's art, artwork, photography, um, film, uh, creative means, theater, all of that. And I think that well, there is a very strong visual sovereignty movement on the Klamath River Basin um, with many different artists and people coming together to create um, performance pieces, exhibitions. Um, and, I, and I think it's a little recognized topic outside of the general and local areas, but it's also a very global movement. So the paintings from the Klamath River Basin and the next week we'll also have a more specific talk on this with uh, Julian Lang, uh, Lynn Risling and Kateri Mastin. Um, but 
there have been many prolific artists that have come out of the Klamath River Basin focusing on environmental um, environmental justice as well as human rights efforts of, of indigenous people in the area. So here's just to name a few, Julian Lang, Lynn Risling, Brian Tripp, uh, George Blake, Brittany Britton, Rick Barto, And that's like the tip of, of the fantastic artists that have really developed out of our region. So that's uh, Julian's artwork, R Klamath River as their guide. And this was from a museum exhibition I did on um, the Klamath River, trying to get people to think more broadly about activism. So ephemera from the Klamath River activism movement and the no gasket or liens of road. Um, so ephemera is basically the things like uh, posters, um, t-shirts, like the like stuff that you see uh, people enacting at protest movements, which I think are art pieces. They often are. And I there's some incredible people who do um, contribute to that. So this is a shirt from one of the protests in 2014, I believe. Um, we went down to the Bureau of Reclamation um, to have them allow more water flows into the Klamath and Trinity. So stop the, tr stop the killing, release the Trinity flow. And I think something to note about these kinds of grassroots advocacy movements too, is that often it takes like, people who care about this, like indigenous people, allies, to go and pressure the government to release water flows, to make sure that the salmon is healthy. And to me, that doesn't seem like a very um, sustainable method to find justice. But people do do that, and it's really important. But it would be a lot easier if it was just a given that this would happen or that the dams would be removed and that was a given and that there would be trust that that would happen. Um, so this is a picture of me, <laughs> a picture of me and my friend Vanessa at the BOR, um, Bureau of Reclamation protest. I'm wearing this shirt. It's a size, it was like a size large in kids. So it's a little tight on me, but um, it really does take a lot of people power to go down and organize um, and come together through these movements, and especially in the movement on the Klamath. So um, Analia Hillman, Yurok tribal member and Klamath Justice Coalition activist, um, no amount of stall stalling will stop the dams from falling. And I think that's a very powerful statement to put out to protect the environment, we will do what we can. So here's uh, some T-shirts from the different movements um, on Dan the Klamath, Bring the Salmon Home. So a lot of these come from like home screen printing things, uh, ho home screen printing operations. Um, so people go to their home and then screen print and have like their own setup and then hand that out these out. And then often there will, there will also be funded by nonprofits that are interested in contributing as well. So, I think that's an, an important aspect. And then photography from the Klamath River activism movement. So this is in Portland. And then all of these are from Regina, who is um, also with Save California Salmon. So she contributed to these photographs to the exhibition that I did, which I appreciate. I love that photograph. I think it's great. Um, so I guess to end, I don't know how much, I think I'm about at time. But um, it's a very complex and in-depth conversation to have about visual sovereignty and activism and art and grassroots organizing. And I think the main point that, that I would want you to take away from this is that this is a generational fight. Um, these, this has been happening since before my grandfather's generation, his father, um, his great-grandfather were fighting these actions against our environment and trying to protect it in the best way we can. And now I'm taking up this mantle and I can't help but think like, what are my kids going to be doing? And like, are they gonna have to take that on too? And it's like, at what point is enough 
enough. Like the environmental destruction that indigenous people have to face every day um, through removal, through ecofascism, through violence is to put it lightly, unacceptable. And I think that um, we should really take note of the people who are doing this advocacy at the grassroots level. Um, and it's quite a few. I, I kind of view myself as more of a historian, not a historian, but like, I don't like love the term historian either, but I, I see myself as somebody who can help at least, you know, um, think through the arts and advocacy portion of it and help um, record these things for future generations so that we remember. And that that also happens through family and friends and oral histories and all the things that make us who we are as indigenous and native people. Um, I just want to thank you for your time and attention. And I'm going to hand it over to Morningstar now. Shimi Sunwi, Morningstar Gali, Elakatke, Chi, Ma'ajumawi is Chi. My name is Morningstar Gali, and I am a, this is Ha'ali <laughs> that decided to join in. Um, I'm a tribal water organizer for Save California Salmon. You want to say your name? No. And so um, I just wanted to, it's good to be here with all of you again. I just wanted to talk a bit about um, some of the collective organizing efforts that we are doing. Can you hold on one second? With Save California Salmon. And um, first want to acknowledge that I am here on Nisanan and Miwok territories and that we have been, um, you know, there has been for the last 30 days, um, our, our organizing and our activism has been happening in, in the streets and in keeping people safe. And so I serve um, as a co-lead for the Healing Justice Committee for the Anti-Police Terror Project here in San Sacramento and also am um, ensuring, you know, through that work that folks are receiving the training that they need um, as, as we work collectively. Um, I also want to acknowledge that um, through these land acknowledgements and through these efforts to, to name places and to claim, reclaim visibility of indigenous peoples, lands and territories that we also um, must acknowledge are non-federally recognized, are state recognized, are terminated, are disenrolled, are indigenous peoples that are not recognized on their own lands and territories um, as continuous genocide and colonialism has always targeted um, our women, our girls, our two-spirit, trans, and non-binary relatives, and that we have always had a history of activism and environmentalism that has come in many different forms and many different names. And so since the times of, of occupation, since the times of invaders landing on our shores, um, since the time here in California of missionization, we have faced incarceration and enslavement of indigenous people's populations. And we are now at a time through the removal of statues, through the removal of monuments to genocide, um, that we are in a moment where that um, needs to be, be acknowledged, needs to be celebrated, and also recognizing that we have much more work ahead of us. So um, thank you for being patient with me as I just wanted to take a moment to speak to that. Let me see if I can share my screen here now. And and so as Brittany had mentioned um, that this is absolutely a generational fight 
And so I won't share the video because I know that we are having some technical issues with the um, with the playback, but this is a clip from 1978 at the federal courthouse in San Francisco. And this is my father, Isidro Bali Jr. And he was speaking to the fishing wars that were taking place and how, um, you know, this is 40 years ago when the US Marshals um, ascended onto tribal peoples that were actively um, fighting for their right to be, to be able to fish um, on their waterways as, as they always have and the violence that they were facing at that time. And so this was the support um, efforts, the community support um, and, and activism that took place to where um, folks, you know, the communities were organizing on the ground and this was people coming together um, to, you know, we, we've had these trade routes um, historically and currently. And so including in that, um, you know, a time that communities were displaced throughout the Bay Area and were able to, to support fishing communities um, by purchasing the fish um, at the time that this was not, not lawful. Um, and so that's part of the continuing work through Safe California Salmon. Um, just speaking to my own experience in working for tribal governments and working for my own tribe, there can be um, at times a lot of conserve, you know, it can be very conservative in how tribes feel that they approach the issues um, of our fishing rights and of our water rights and not necessarily wanting to um, feel that there's, there's friction being caused with the state. And so now that I, I worked as the tribal historic preservation officer for my tribe for over four years. And now that I'm working outside of, of that tribal government structure, um, there is a way that we are able to advocate um, and work with organizations, work with communities. Um, a lot of these, these fights and efforts um, are not necessarily led through the tribes directly themselves, but on, on the outside from organizers um, and from community members that are able to, to be more, more vocal in speaking out about what is taking place. Um, and so again, these are photos from, um, from Regina. I want to acknowledge that Regina Chickaloza and um, the fish camps that we have held through Save California Salmon and being able to connect and bring our children, being able to have our families present and talk about this relationship um, with the salmon. And I had mentioned briefly on, on the last presentation that, you know, personally, I, um, within my own tribe, that the Pacific Gas and Electric that we have been fighting PG&E now um, for many decades. And so, you know, people are seeing that with the fires and what has taken place in, in PG&E not um, being accountable to, to what has occurred, but they have done this to California's indigenous peoples for, for many years. Now, um, they never fulfilled their promise to instill fish ladders on our river, on the Pitt River, where six out of the seven dams were placed on our river. And so we have not had salmon within our rivers for over 80 years. And so this is um, my daughter that you just um, saw a few moments ago and, um, and an elder, Jean. And we had gathered in Reading and we had over 200 tribal members um, and community members there in support. And um, 
DWR was was not happy with because there's this, um, you know, there's this messaging that that uh, these state um, entities work well with tribes and that um, they're working well with tribal peoples and and so when we show up and we challenge that false narrative um, and we show up um, as a large force. Um, then they have to go back and, you know, and, and answer to that. And so I think I'll just end there. Let's see if I can stop share. And we can, and I can leave, I think that's my time there. So I'll leave it open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Morningstar. Um, that was a great presentation. I always love hearing you speak.